Good morning, I'm Tamara Shoemaker. Um, before the pandemic closures, my husband and I were really too busy. It had become kind of a theme of our married life. If there was space to fill on the calendar, we filled it. The condition of our calendar just grew more and more cluttered the longer that we were married because we were un unable or unwilling to let go of repeated events that we had enjoyed before. And so we would book ourselves again. And then we were also constantly adding new ones not to mention, once we had kids, we had to add in their activities as well um, and their, you know, their plans and everything. So before the pandemic closures, I dreaded Thursdays. It was one long day every week where I would rise early, I would go to work, um, come back home with the kids. Um, I wouldn't even let them out of the, uh, out of the van. Um, they would have to use the bathroom at school. We would um, dump all the book bags in the, in the door of the house and then we'd hit the road again. We'd go down to piano lessons. And then after piano lessons, we'd head over to karate lessons for one of the kids. We'd have supper there while we were out and then have another karate lesson. By the time we got back home again, um, our poor deserted house had been deserted all day and it was past bedtimes and we were all exhausted. So that was every Thursday. In practicality, packing all of those events into one day made sense because uh, we live approximately 15 minutes outside of anything, at least 15 minutes, sometimes 20 minutes, outside of anything at all, grocery shopping, schools, church, whatever. Um, so there's a good bit of gas and time consumption if we run back and forth between things. And my planner husband, who is very organized, had scheduled things in the most efficient and organized manner as uh, possible. But I hated Thursdays. And then the pandemic hit and we didn't go anywhere for a long while. So while I won't say that the pandemic was any kind of a blessing, um, I was glad to wake up on Thursday mornings and feel like I had a bit of time to be able to, you know, mess with, to be able to breathe for a little bit. So um, to James, up to this point from James 3.13 all the way to James 4.12, he's been talking about humility humbling ourselves before the Lord in some various ways. So in chapter four, verse 13, James jumps to the other end of the spectrum, arrogance. He says, now listen, you who say today or tomorrow, we will go to this city or that city, go to this or that city, spend a year here, uh, a year there, carry on business and make money. Why, you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast and brag. All such boasting is evil. Anyone then who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it, sins. And that's James 4, verses 13 to 17. So I've learned so many things over this past year. I'm certainly not the same person I was on March 12th, 2020. Um, one of the key things that I've learned is this. Never take the time that the Lord has given you for granted. To put it even more strongly, I have tended to feel entitled to my own time. I have, I <laughs> have 24 hours in a day. How will I fill up those 24 hours? Anything that comes into my zone of time management is subject to my own time manipulation. So in March 13th, 2020 rolled around, I stared at the three ring binder of lesson plans I'd made for my classroom of students at Skyline Middle School, where I was supposed to teach that day. And I'd spent hours the afternoon before cutting out various things to use for an activity, preparing every last detail, pushing away the butterflies that, you know, inevitably erupt at the thought of teaching middle schoolers, <laughs> most of whom were taller than I was by at least six inches, some of whom sported facial hair. Um, I was intimidated, and when I'm intimidated, I tend to plan extra, spend extra time making sure that I'm prepared in case, you know, in any event eventuality, I am caught off balance. So that notebook lay still on my lap. The lesson plans for that day were completely useless because my 24-hour time management had been messed with, and no amount of manipulation would bring any kind of fruit from my efforts to teach that lesson. I did end up teaching that lesson to my own three children um, a few days later, kind of adjusted for age and circumstances, but I wasn't able to teach the children I was supposed to teach with it. So James says, you are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. 
Um, it sounds harsh, but it's true. We get so caught up in our circumstances that they become our whole world. And as I said, we tend to grasp those circumstances so tightly, we rest them under our own control that we begin to expect that control. And if something happens to throw us off track, we feel things. We feel betrayal or perhaps anger or helplessness or irritation or just a mixture of all of those things at one time. We feel entitled to our own time here on this planet for the lifespan that we think we need or the, the lifespan that we map out. So how many times have we heard someone heard of someone who has passed away too young and thought that's just wrong? And it does feel wrong. Those who die young seem to have lived an unfulfilled life or an unfinished life, right? But James says, you are a mist that appears for a while and then vanishes. <coughs> Excuse me. How this, how this contrasts with an eternal God who has existed from before time began to where he, he even granted us the gift of time. He formulated time, order and tempo, right? And he placed it into the spinning globe set in space. And it is impossible for us to think outside of the bounds of time. Our minds are bound by it. Hosea shows us uh, just a glimpse of this contrast in, in Hosea chapter six, verses three and four. He says, as surely as the sun rises, he, God, will appear. What can I do with you, Judah? Your love is like the morning mist, like the early dew that disappears. So the rising sun is a steady time marker. You can bank on the fact that you are going to see the sun arise the next morning, no matter how many clouds are going to cover it. It's coming. The mist, the dew, on the other hand, not so much. Um, one of the advantages of living in the mountains where we live is having access to some beautiful hiking trails. And um, I've sat on a cliff ledge before and looked out over a valley where the mists just lie low, kind of sitting in the hollows of the land and the steady, brilliant sun comes up over them. And he spreads, it spreads its light and its heat and slowly, but as I watch, the mists begin to disappear. James says, instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. I don't think James was giving like a, a rote sprinkling of magical verbiage to say, much like, you know, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. Um, these are prayers, um, but they have the little heart or meaning behind them. It's just words, right? Hey, church, tack on a, if it's your will to the end of your prayers or your plans, and you're going to find that all your dreams begin to come true and all your plans are a success. James is talking about laying down the arrogance that we carry, that our plans trump. God's plans or God's purposes. So he's talking about pushing aside our own entitled thinking that we deserve our time, right? Isaiah 55, 8 and 9 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my way, your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So rather than recognizing that God is the infinite giver of this finite box of time that we put him into, um, or that we ourselves exist in, we pull him into that box with us and we demand that he stays within the constraints that we give him, right? James is absolutely right to address our arrogance in doing that. Our time is not our own. It's God's. And it's to be done with as he requires, as he plans. We can make our plans, but we do it with the recognition that every breath that we take and every beat of our hearts, those are God's. We're not entitled to them. They are a gift from him. And when we take that perspective, humbling ourselves enough to realize that this universe does not run according to our plans and our purposes, issues like, you know, the pandemic become a lot less dire. There are all sorts of things wrapped up in this idea, humility, letting go, trust, acceptance, awe, and selflessness, open hands, right? None of these things to note come easily or naturally to me at all, selfish creature that I am. So help me, Lord, to let you be God and not me, because I'm not cut out for the job. Let's, that, let's let that be our prayer today. That's going to be my prayer today. I challenge you to make it your prayer as well. Have a great day, and I will see you tomorrow.